you know, it's been a, a good thing to focus on safe haven assets for a while now, just from a, a preparing standpoint. But now I think it's crucial. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2022 Silver Krugerrands for only 409 over spot. To order, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest. John Rubino is the founder of dollarcollapse.com. He's been on our channel over the years. He's back with us again here to weigh in on what happened, what we just went through in 2021 and what lies ahead in 2022. Today is Wednesday, December 29th, 2021. John, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Hey, Don, again, thanks for having me back. I, I love these year end things. You know, the uh, that's always when the story is best, it seems like. Well, there's a lot that happened, a lot to talk about that we can glean from the lessons learned in 2021 and what that's indicates to us what lessons can teach us about what's likely to come next. Your website and books that you've written regarding the dollar collapse has been a frequent theme for a long time. Uh, you've been speaking with us for years about that, and I saw you met you for the first time in person at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium, where you spoke on that same topic. And in fact, when people ask the question, which is a natural one, well, when is the dollar going to collapse? And then you zoom out and show the long-term chart from 1913 and the formation of the Fed to, to today or any segment thereof. You could say, well, what part of the dollar collapse did you miss? Um, because it's been all around us in many ways. And you've helped to point that out to us, but even more so to uh, factors that could result in a more calamitous sort of final collapse uh, in the future that people would do well to prepare for. Be before we talk about preparedness for that and get to some viewers questions. Could you talk to us about preparedness in general? In fact, as we were just getting started here, you mentioned that you're getting walloped with record snows in the uh, Pacific Northwest. And we should, we should touch on that first because there's preparedness is much more than just financial. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, my story is a pretty good uh, example of that where you don't usually get that much snow in the Pacific Northwest. So what you prepare for tends to be other things than, uh, you know, three feet of snow or something like that. That's a rarity. But in December, we got the most snow ever out here. And that's, um, you know, that illustrates the point that you want to be prepared for lots of different things, not just the most likely thing that can happen wherever you are. Uh, because each, um, each stressor, you know, each thing that, uh, that puts you at risk has its own characteristics. And it's a good idea to, uh, to, to look at the things that help you with everything and definitely do those, like put some extra food away, have a generator or some other extra source of power, things like that. You want to do that in any, any circumstances. And um, then look at things that are kind of specific that, uh, that might not um, apply to the other possible things that can go wrong, but you work on those too, you know. And with snow, that means, um, you know, in our case, make friends with somebody that has a four by four with a blade who can come do your driveway, you know, because you it, out here you don't necessarily want to own a big snow blower because it might not snow again in the coming year. But uh, it's good to have a friend that can take care of that for you, and and. Um, you know, that, that might, in a broader sense, be the, the very most important part of prepping is that you want to embed yourself in your community um, so that there are people that have your back in unforeseen circumstances, you know, and in return, you take care of them. Um, and together, you're a lot stronger than if you're all by yourself with a lot of gear, you know, that's a, it's good to have the right gear, but it's, it's better to have people who you can count on when times get strange. Because I, I think there, there's a it's a pretty safe bet that they're going to get stranger from here going, going on. Yeah, there, I wanted to tag on a couple aspects of what you just talked about. One was, remember about two weeks ago, we were having high wind 
episodes all across the country in different areas. People were either, some were, honest to gosh, major tornadoes getting hit. Uh, Kentucky and some other places got hit with some major tornadoes. But also uh, just high winds that were causing power line outages and that sort of thing. We had several hours of power power outage where we live. It gave me an opportunity to test something I wanted to test for some time and had been putting off and shouldn't have. But I finally did test that, in fact, our gas fireplace does work even when there's no power. I was told by an electrician who I had asked to come out and a, and, a, and a gas fitter years ago to, I wanted him to retrofit my gas fireplace so that it had, would have a manual gas valve rather than an automatic one because I was afraid that it wouldn't work when the power went out. But the, the uh, gas fitter who came out said, no, he says this, you've got a pilot light in there and that is a thermocouple and a, tr- a little trickle of power from the thermocouple is enough to open up the main gas valve. This should work without any power. And we tested that during the power outage, and by golly, we did uh, could light the main burner just by uh, flipping the switch on the wall, even though there was no power in the entire house. And um, that was a, a good confirmation of that. And then the second thing you mentioned about having a network of people that you can rely on uh, as part of some of getting some extra supplies before that storm hit, um, I was loading up some heavy equipment and a guy came over to try to help me lift the heavy piece of equipment into the into the car and uh, I strained my arm and shoulder and <laughs> during that and I ha- hasn't completely mended yet but just realizing that yeah you can be a, a lone ranger with a bunch of gear but if you get laid up uh, then all that gear may not be doing much good if, if you're you know recuperating or rehabilitating or whatever so it really is uh, a more powerful plan B is to have the resilience of some uh, additional friends, neighbors, acquaintances, family members who you can rely on and whom, who rely on you uh, when times get tough. If uh, other lessons that you that come to mind, I was asking you about what have we learned in 2021 or what have we seen play out uh, that sort of confirmed the concern that you've articulated for years about how we're sort of balanced on a precipice of sort of requiring everything to go right. I think I remember a line you said at the uh, Liberty Mastermind Symposium, you said there's a myriad of things that could go wrong and any one of them could, could start this whole thing tumbling down. Could you tell us where you see us now in terms of that balancing act and how poised we are um, with everything needing to go right to keep us afloat at this point? Well, yeah, I think in the sound money community, we we have understood for a long time that we couldn't trust the financial systems and the people in charge of them. Uh, But in 2020 and 2021, we learned that we can't really trust the public health establishment either. So there's not many people left to trust out there. Um, And inflation is picking up. You know, all of a sudden, um, inflation, as it is understood by regular people, is starting to rage. It's, you know, we've had inflation for years, but it's been narrowly focused in financial assets like stocks, bonds, and real estate. But now it's everywhere. You know, every time you go to Costco or the grocery store or whatever, you notice that your cost of living is going up. So, so that's happening, which is putting a lot of pressure on the Fed to raise interest rates or otherwise tighten at a time when the financial markets are priced for perfection. Uh, For instance, the stock market is as richly valued as it's ever been in the U.S. Um, And it's got extremely poor breadth, which means that only a few companies are pulling up all the big indexes. You know, if you uh, you take five tech stocks out of the Nasdaq and it just tanks. And same thing with the S&P 500. Just a handful of companies are elevating it. If I could interrupt you there, because we've seen that before, right? We saw that in the dot com uh, era, for example, they said, you know, Microsoft and Cisco and just a handful of others were the were the leaders. These these four horsemen of the of the Nasdaq there when it was hitting like five thousand, and then it, it plunged down to two thousand after after that collapse. Yeah, I think it was Bill Fleckenstein, a, a money manager who was a big short seller back then, who had this great line. He said that you know the global financial system depends on the U.S. stock market, and the U.S. stock market depends on five companies almost none of which make any money. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a recipe for a huge crash. And we're kind of back there again. So we're, we're in a, um, and the Fed was tightening back then too, in, in the late 1990s. So we, we basically um, are in that kind of a situation now where we got the Fed kind of feeling forced to tighten because inflation is, is starting to rage 
in, um, in actual consumer prices instead of just financial asset prices. Um, so they don't feel like they have a choice but to at least attempt to tighten. And stocks probably can't handle higher interest rates. So we've set ourselves up for yet another big crash. And um, that doesn't mean it happens this week or this month or even really next year, although it sure does feel like it's going to. But um, it, it means that we've created the conditions for another big financial crisis, which means on the financial side of the ledger, not, the, not just the weather side and the food side of our lives, we need to be preparing for something dramatic because the, uh, the conditions have recurred that in the past uh, have led to big crashes. So, uh, you know, it's been a, a good thing to focus on safe haven assets for a while now, just from a, a preparing standpoint. But now I think it's crucial that um, you, you be very careful about how many um, bond funds you own or how big your bank account is, or if you have bank stocks like JP Morgan Chase or Citigroup or Goldman Sachs. They've done great so far, but they may not do as well in a market where financial assets get whacked by rising interest rates. Uh, so it, it um, well, personally, I'm, I'm mostly in safe haven assets now and mostly out of financial assets because of that, because the risk reward um, calculus has changed so dramatically. Um, so, you know, if it wasn't time to be in gold and silver and mining stocks two years ago or even last year, it kind of is now. And uh, um, luckily, precious metals and some of the other safe haven assets like um, oil company stocks um, are, are not through the roof the way a lot of tech stocks, stocks are. So they're re still relatively cheap. They still have relatively decent dividend yields. So it's not a really painful transition to go from financial stocks to uh, gold miners and energy stocks, you still you still get an income from it. You uh, you are in things that aren't overvalued necessarily, so they aren't likely to crash along with everything else. So this is probably a good time to make that kind of a financial transition. You mentioned the Fed in a tightening mode as at, at reflecting back to the dot com bubble time. Do you believe that the Fed will be able to meaningfully tighten or that that will cause, as soon as they start doing that, that that will immediately cause the markets to roll over and that will just have to be abandoned? I absolutely do believe that. And that's a, a, the big second part of this story. You know, if the Fed tries to tighten, they will tank financial asset prices. But as soon as the stock market starts to fall, see, then the question is, how far does it have to fall before the Fed um, takes it all back? And um, we don't know that, but we know that uh, once stocks start meaningfully dropping, the Fed will panic and go back into easing mode. And uh, historically, you know, we've seen that happen two or three times, depending on how you define it, in the last 15 or so years. And each time um, you saw financial asset prices and especially gold and silver go up dramatically after that, because all of a sudden, you know, when the Fed is taking money away, that um, pulls the rug out from under overvalued assets. But when the Fed starts dumping money back into the system, then that money has to go somewhere. And you see it, you see it reflate a lot of the things that were falling. Now, I don't necessarily think stocks recover that easily this time, just because they're they're so overvalued and and uh, you know we're so close to the end of the whole fiat currency experiment that I I wouldn't say buy the dip. You know, the next time the S and P five hundred drops by ten percent, that that isn't necessarily a, a a buy signal, but it is a signal that the Fed is going to start easing again. So I, I think that um, based on what happened the last two and a half to three times around, um, the stuff that you buy now as a safe haven may get whacked along with everything else in the early stages of this process, but they'll rebound almost parabolically after the Fed starts easing again. And I, I think, you know, the reason why this is such a, a big decision point in 2022 is that it's completely possible that people realize finally that the Fed is never going to be able to tighten. You know, when, when they uh, try it yet again, it fails yet again because the financial markets crash and the Fed immediately backtracks and starts easing. In other words, they, they give us negative interest rates or QE on a scale even bigger than what they've done in the past. 
um, people realize that that's it. You know, that is our future. We have easy money to the horizon now because the Fed has proven um, over the past decade and a half that it just can't tighten anymore. You know, the financial markets won't let it. And if uh, if Fed does try to tighten and financial markets do tank, that that's systematically dangerous. That's not just a bear market in equities. That's a the potential destruction of the entire financial system as it's currently set up. So when people realize that uh, this whole, oh, you know, daddy's going to come home and take care of stuff, we'll have adult supervision in the financial markets, when that's all over, you know, when the guys in charge cannot fix what's wrong, um, then you see a huge change in market psychology. And, um, and that's going to create a very different world from what we've seen in the last decade. And it's going to be a very disturbing world for people who have trusted the government by holding on to dollars and assets that are based on dollars. What would you say to someone who asked to push that question a little bit harder and said, once it's revealed that, that sugar daddy can only keep flooding out uh, c- cash and currency creation as the, as the remedy and, and, and dropping interest rates and cannot tighten rates and cannot pull back on, on their um, buy, you know, purchase programs of inflating the ba- Fed balance sheet, um, why wouldn't the markets just react to, okay, great, we're, we're in candy land mode forever. Uh, we're not going to have the, the tap is not going to be turned off. Why wouldn't that just be a celebratory uh, uh, pedal to the metal for a continuation of the bubble of everything rather than causing a uh, loss of confidence? Well, because probably what comes along with the Fed's capitulation is inflation continuing to increase. In other words, if the Fed tried to control inflation and completely failed, then market psychology would say that we're in an inflationary environment forever now. In other words, they they can't react to inflation in ways that will control inflation anymore. Therefore, um, prices are just going to rise forever. So you'd see a lot of the money that... uh, that in past Fed easing cycles have gone into financial asset prices. In other words, they went to bid up stocks, bonds, and real estate. A lot of that money is liable to flow into inflation hedges. Um, On on the one hand, regular people are going to go to Costco and they're going to buy a year's worth of toilet paper and big bottles of whiskey and whatever else it is they know they're going to be buying. and, uh, and, you know, they used to buy monthly. Well, this time they're going to buy it all at once, which will push prices up even further, which will cause more panic buying. So, you you know, you risk a, a kind of a, that death spiral in the value of fiat currencies that we've been talking about because people just panic and decide they're going to buy all their stuff right away. And at the same time, you get investment capital flowing into things that probably benefit from that. And that is farmland, really well-chosen rental houses, energy assets, and gold and silver. You know, the, the real asset um, side of the, um, the investment spectrum tends to attract a lot more capital when you have this kind of inflationary phase change. You know, they, they call it inflationary expectations, basically. That's what the, uh, that's the holy grail of the Fed. They want well-anchored inflationary expectations because that allows them to, to fool us all into thinking things are okay if we assume that inflation is going to be low. Well, if we assume that it's going to be high and rising, that's the opposite. And that's exactly what these guys are terrified of. But that's what we might get after the next Fed capitulation. And that's a whole different ballgame because then, then, well, you know, the analog is the 1970s when um, things basically seemed to spin out of control. You know, we had double digit inflation and we had to fight that with double digit interest rates. And so we, we survived the, the monetary crisis of the 1970s by raising interest rates to literally 16, 18, 20%, depending on the instrument. And once people realize we can't do that, anymore, then that changes everything. You know, we came out of the 1970s into the 1980s, which was a relatively healthy, stable environment uh, for investing. But we we won't do that this time because we don't have any tools left um, to fight rising inflation. And so that is liable to change everything. It'll give us, you know, the 1970s for a little while and then maybe Weimar Germany after that. You know, it's hard to say what comes after that because panic is a very hard thing to predict. It's nonlinear. You know, it's a chaotic situation. And we're very likely, or at least it's very possible, that we'll have some kind of a financial panic 
based on rising inflation and falling currency values um, next time around. Just to make sure that this is clear to me and to everyone here, what you're talking about when the public psychology comes to grasp that inflation is here to stay or it's going to be a major factor for a period of time, the idea is that people who are earning and, and setting money aside, currency aside, dollars in the bank or in bonds, bonds or savings or, or certificates of deposit or that sort of thing will suddenly realize that saving currency, saving dollars, and thinking I'll use this later to buy something I need later is a loser's game at that point because those dollars are going to be devaluing so quickly that you will not be able to buy much in the future. Therefore, you're going to try to grab the real stuff now and get rid of your dollars as quickly as possible. And it's that, it's that sentiment shift of people wanting to get rid of their dollars because they see them as a wasting asset um, and instead to grab real things that then can cause a buying frenzy on real things. Is that what you're, is that the point? And it, um, that, that's definitely the mechanism, except I think a lot of people won't see it that way. They won't think, oh, my dollars are becoming less valuable. They'll think, oh, my God, the price of milk and eggs and bread and used cars is going through the roof. So I better buy those things now because I know I'm going to need them. Um, and um, so that's, that's the same thing as saying my dollars are collapsing in value. But um, I think most people tend to focus in their lives on the prices that they have to pay. And when those prices start to soar, that changes everybody's behavior. Um, so, you know, it's basically the same thing said differently. Well, it's interesting because I think what you're pointing out is in the face of a, a basically the currency, which people have confused with money, in the face of the currency um, failing us. It's failing its promise of, in fact, it's one of the, one of the um, missions of the Fed is to maintain a stable currency. And, and the, the failure of that is not recognized for what it is. And you and I were talking before we got started on the failure of lots of major institutions. And when I mean institutions, it's not just organizations. It's pillars of our, of our civilized culture uh, that are failing us. And you, you, talk, you touched on it just briefly about loss of confidence, loss of trust. And we interviewed James, Rawls, James Rawls, the founder of survivalblog.com. And he talks about, we are living in the age of deception and betrayal. Plan accordingly, relocate accordingly, invest accordingly. So can you talk to us about what, are the, what you see as the major, basically, uh, failures of major institutions that are going to lose, are, either are losing or have lost or are in the process of losing their confidence and trust of the ordinary people and how that's going to impact us. It's basically took over the government. And since that time, they've been running the financial system to benefit themselves at the expense of everybody else. Uh, and that's not something that people really see, you know, because nobody knows what a 1% interest rate means. What it, what it actually means is that the banks have lowered interest rates to a point where they're very profitable and their favorite clients get richer and richer, while savers can't earn anything on their savings. So it's a, an income transfer from regular people to the very rich. Um, and people don't completely necessarily understand that mechanism, but they do know it's harder and harder to save. And they do see people getting richer and richer out there. So the financial system is generally starting to be understood, has failed us massively. Um, What's happened in the last couple of years is that the, almost the last sector of the, um, the ruling class that we've really trusted, the public health sector, has kind of done the same thing. You, you know, you could look at the, um, the things that have gone on in the last couple of years. Of, and, you know, instead of a public health crisis, basically a business scam. You know, if you follow the money, um, uh, this virus emerges that was probably... Uh, um, created via U.S. research funding that uh, just happens to play into the strength of big pharma because they just happen to have vaccines on hand, which make them hundreds of billions of dollars over the last couple of years at the expense of small businesses all around the world. You know, we wiped out half the small businesses in the U.S. while enriching a handful of billionaires and uh, the political class and big pharma. Uh, and you know, that I think is not something that a lot of people completely get, but I think a lot of people are getting bits and pieces of it and figuring out that this isn't a good deal for them. You know, the uh, um, 
the people who work online and the political class and the um, the big tech millionaires and big pharma are all making money. Well, you know, a regular person's kid might still not be back in school yet. You know, they spend a year um, being homeschooled effectively. And then when they went back to school, they had to wear a mask, which was a nightmare for them. And your small business isn't working. You know, it's um, it's been a nightmare for regular people and kind of a picnic for the 1%. And people are starting to get that too. So that's, that's kind of a combination of the financial system and the public health system failing us in an epic way. And there's very little left beyond that, except geopolitics, which we seem to be screwing up on a huge scale too. You know, the Afghanistan um, exit um, kind of made a mockery of all the people who died over there trying to um, nation build or whatever it was we were doing over there. You know, the people, our soldiers who went over there kind of believed in the, the mission. And um, it turned out to be really nothing. You know, it turned out to accomplish nothing, all their sacrifice. Uh, meanwhile, we're picking fights with um, basically half the rest of the world, it seems right now. You know, the Russia and Ukraine could be a shooting war any morning that we wake up and see the news. And China and, um, and Taiwan are looking the same way. And the US is liable to get sucked into both of them. And which means our soldiers are gonna go over there and die for something that I think a lot of people realize is not very important. So um, it, it's easy if you're paying a minimal amount of attention to conclude that nobody's working for us anymore. Um, and all the, um, the big systems and the people running the big systems are working for themselves to enrich themselves and they're doing it at our expense. So I, I think the, you know, the trust horizon, in other words, the, uh, the distance that you're willing to go out to trust people is shrinking now. You know, it used to be the CDC and the, uh, the NSA and, and the military and the big banks. You know, we used to trust those guys and the Federal Reserve at one point. We trusted them all. Now we don't anymore. So now it's friends, neighbors, possibly the local government, if you know those people and can look them in the eye and shake hands with them, local farmers um, and, and other people that are close enough that we can get a sense of who they are and we can tell when they're ripping us off. Um, and, you know, that plays out in the financial system as a loss of trust in the currency that is being run by these guys that we no lo longer trust. So um, it's very hard to rebuild something like that once you've broken it. So, you know, it could be decades before people come around to saying, oh, all right, I guess possibly the central bank knows what they're doing. Or, I mean, you know, maybe the pharmaceutical companies can be trusted. And, and you know, it, it may never come back. So I, I think we're at the beginning of a, or we're in the process of a very serious phase change in our perception of the world as it is being run and the people running it. I would like to add to the list of uh, disenfranchised um, or, or I guess institutions with whom people have lost uh, trust and that's the uh, mainstream media who are supposed to be the watchdogs uh, breaking the news on all this stuff as well as even even school boards and the education system in addition at all levels. Um, one of the comments that uh, we got from Alex Newman, who is an, who's an advocate uh, for parents' rights and for, for constitutional freedoms, that sort of thing, in the face of government overreach, is that the next stage of awakening is not that these systems are failing, but that these systems, as you pointed out, have failed us because they are doing they are succeeding to do exactly what they were designed to do, whether that's the educational system uh, designed to put a wedge between uh, children and their parents and have the children become wards of the state and become dependent uh, with the idea of lifetime dependency as, as a norm and no ex expectation of privacy, that sort of thing, or the uh, mainstream media, uh, the way it's been consolidated for decades and decades. I mean, my, my parents were seriously concerned about this back in the 70s and the 80s, and I didn't know why they were getting so worked up about the consolidation of newspapers back then or whatever, but the idea being that there will be one message and you will you will receive it and accept it. And, and I learned from them to be skeptical of when you start to see this one message uh, coming out. So I think I'm not sure that that awakening has happened yet. People may be sensing, as you're saying, that the 1% are winning and most of us are losing. Okay, that we got that. But I'm not sure that the next awakening of, and that's exactly how it was 
designed to be uh, from the founders of the education system or the founders of the central banks or the founders of the fill in the blank. Your thoughts on that level of awakening, do you think we reach that? Uh, how or, or what percentage of the population has to reach that before it really makes it makes a difference, it actually can affect the trajectory of the way things are going? Well, you know, I, I think the, you're right. The media and the educational system, those are two very important parts of the, the story. And I think with the media, uh, polling shows that nobody trusts the media anymore. Um, but I think there's, there's a really um, hopeful trend within the media, which is independent sources bubbling up and gaining an audience that isn't controlled by corporations and doesn't have as its business model trying to enrage people so they stay engaged, you know? And, and uh, so you, you know, look at Substack right now where a lot of really good reporters are going from the mainstream media, you know, they're leaving the New York Times or Rolling Stone or whatever and setting up their own Substack feeds that people can subscribe to and they're doing legitimate journalism or your show, for instance, is a good example of that. You have an audience that, uh, that knows that, you know, even if we get something wrong here, we're telling the truth as we see it. You know, we're, we're trying to figure things out in an honest way. Um, and to the extent that that becomes a bigger and bigger part of the media, I, I think we have kind of an organic shift going on. Just, just like in Sound Money, you know, if, if people leave fiat currencies, which are in a lot of ways evil and are quickly being destroyed and move over to sound money like gold and silver, they're, um, they're increasing the amount of truth in their lives. And when they switch from MSNBC and CNN and Fox to Glenn Greenwald and uh, Matt Taibbi and Jimmy Dore and you, um, the same thing's happening on, on the media side for them. You know, they're getting the story straight, at least as the people giving it see it. Uh, and, and I think that's happening organically. So I, that's a really hopeful thing to me that I think we could have a completely new media ecosystem pretty soon based on um, an honest attempt to find the truth and um, an audience that understands that process and is making choices accordingly. And same thing with the education system. You know, a, a lot of charter schools are coming along. And I think that's a new market for charter schools, by the way, is actual education instead of indoctrination. And uh, a lot of parents are suddenly, see, you know, one of the good things that, that came from the last year's lockdown is that parents, you know, whose kids were, um, were being taught online by the schools actually could stand behind their kids and look on the laptop to see what was actually happening. And they were appalled by a lot of what they saw. So you've got an awakened generation of parents out there who are gonna make better educational choices too. So, you know, I, I, I think it's gonna be a really rough decade, but I see hopeful signs everywhere of uh, the marketplace of ideas and the marketplace of investing uh, moving in the right direction as people educate themselves. You know, it took a lot <laughs> to uh, to convince people to start paying attention, but the last couple of years have finally done it. And I think there's a critical mass of people out there making good decisions, and that's going to change the marketplace on a lot of different levels. Yeah, one area of risk related to that is another institution, if you want to call it that, is certainly that the idea that the Internet was going to be this level playing field, this this equal information interchange opportunity where anyone who had a, 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 a voice could go ahead and speak and others could listen if they were interested. And we've certainly seen in the past couple of years that if the message that you have to share is not favored by the elite, that you can be deplatformed and silenced, or at least they'll attempt in pretty powerful ways to do that. So some of those embers of hope that you identify might be dependent on access to that platform. And so I think that that's another uh, battleground that we're facing is the battleground for the equality of uh, access to basically having a, a voice in the public square. And even our channel, as people know, we used to be only on YouTube. Now we're also on Brighteon, Rumble, SoundCloud, and uh, we're, we're looking at branching out into some additional places so that uh, we can talk about the things that matter in people's lives and not uh, suddenly find ourselves uh, unavailable to people. But folks, if you go to libertyandfinance.com, our homepage, make sure that you sign up for our free mailing list there by putting your name and email address in there. We'll make sure that you get all of our interviews, including those with John. A couple of uh, viewers' questions, if we could, John, um, related to this. Uh, 
you've talked about assets like safe haven assets that can come into favor in the event of a dollar collapse again your website dollarcollapse.com so this is right up your alley uh irish jaw 2 says why are people underappreciating gold and silver especially in relation to other assets such as bitcoin gold and silver especially gold what what gold does is just sit there and that's that's not a weakness that's a strength because it it um it, it sustains the buying power of whatever you put into it. In other words, if you buy $1,000 worth of gold, um, 50 years from now, that gold is gonna buy you the same amount of real stuff as your $1,000 did today. Now, in a bubble market, when things are going up you know, 80%, 90% a year in a lot of cases, which is what's happening with tech stocks, um, just sitting there doesn't seem very exciting. Um, it's on the downward sloping part of the cycle where, you know, when those um, high flying stocks you bought are now down by 80 percent that you look over at uh, safe haven assets and go, oh, my God, I wish I was in gold. You know, so that that's that's basically the way the process always works. Gold doesn't look exciting when we're very optimistic about our tech stocks because they're they're soaring. Now, Bitcoin is is an emerging asset class. Cryptos in general are. And we're still trying to figure out what they are and how they um, how they fit into a future monetary system. Right now, they're being treated by the marketplace like tech stocks. In other words, um, cryptos are an ecosystem of several thousand um, different coins. Just like in the 1990s, there were all these dot coms out there, and money is pouring into the sector because, first of all, it's brand new and it's it's, it's exciting. Some of them have gone way up. And that's very exciting. Um, and we don't completely understand what they are. So it's easy to read whatever we want to into them. And I, I you know, it's completely possible that cryptos end up playing a big role in the, a future monetary system. But they are not the same thing as physical precious metals. You know, it could be that they're complementary at some point because cryptos can be a, a digital asset that as long as the Internet is up and running, um, have some value as currency as well as just an asset you can save. Uh, they will never replace physical gold, though, uh, because that's something that actually exists in this world, and it's not dependent on the internet. It's not depending on a hard drive, you know, still being available and you remembering the password for it, nothing like that. Um, so it, it's completely possible that cryptos have an extremely volatile few years here. You know, they've gone up like tech stocks. And if the stock market tanks, they could go down like tech stocks. And, and we've seen Bitcoin do that several times in its in its short existence so far. Um, so I think that's still to be decided where cryptos end up in the future monetary system. But I, I think that um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be con considered as part of the um, the real asset universe, along with gold, silver, and all the other things. Uh, but I don't think they replace gold and silver. You know, you need physical assets that you can have on hand and use um, in a time when something like that becomes necessary. So um, having said all that, you know, gold still has its parabolic rise out there. And in, in each cycle, um, towards the end of the cycle, when people get worried about inflation and, uh, and, and they start acting accordingly with their money, gold and silver go straight up for a couple of years. Uh, and we will see that at some point. So right now, it's preserving purchasing power. But there will come a time when so much money pours into what is a very small market in precious metals uh, that they just take off. And you see, you know, gold, silver go from here to $200 an ounce. Gold go from here to $5,000 an ounce. And the gold and silver mining stocks go up, you know, quite a bit more in percentage terms than gold and silver do. So, you know, it's going to be a really exciting market, precious metals. Um, but that usually comes towards the end of a cycle. And in this case, I think it comes or it begins when the Fed backtracks on this latest tapering, you know, when they take it back and they say, uh, you know what, we're going to cut interest rates to negative 1%. Sorry about the, the last six months of attempted taper. Uh, that's when gold and silver will just go straight up. And, uh, and so, so they'll give you a lot of excitement if you're patient enough to wait through the period that comes before that. A couple of viewers' questions that are tightly related to what you were just talking about, and then I think uh, we'll be out of time. But uh, again, with you as the founder of dollarcollapse.com, uh, Andres Lopez says, 
how fast can a dollar collapse actually happen? Well, you know the old saying from, I think it's Ernest Hemingway about a friend of his who went bankrupt, that, that he did it slowly at first and then all at once. And that in financial markets, that's frequently how things happen. You know, you, uh, you just drift along and you, imbalances build up and they build up, but they don't seem like a problem. And then all of a sudden they're really a problem and everything just reprices. Uh, you know, we've seen that in the stock market over and over again, and, and we see we saw it in real estate in uh, 2008, 2009, when houses that had been going up forever went down by 30 or 40 or 50 percent. Uh, I think we'll see the same thing in the currency markets at some point. And, it, you know, again, it's liable to coincide with the uh, the Fed giving up one more time and going back to easing. You know, if we have negative interest rates in the U.S. with five, six, seven percent inflation, um, that's a an unprecedentedly crazy financial market, and it's it, you know it's going to reflect badly on the currency that's the bedrock of that financial market. So, um, you know, I, I hate putting dates on predictions because that's a, a recipe for uh, a bad paper trail out there. But uh, you know, 2022 could be the year when a lot of these decisions get made and kind of set the stage for this you know final move in. The currencies and final move in precious metals you know we could start that process in the not too distant future so here's a follow-up question thank you for that uh from debbie nugin who says once the collapse happens will people still be using the dollar how many dollars should we hold when this event occurs well you want to have some cash on hand just because it's a very liquid thing to transact with so don't completely get rid of cash uh, but cash will get a lot less valuable when it happens, see probably what we'll do, I mean, and this is just probably because there are a lot of different ways that this can go, but we'll probably have what's called a currency reset where we just change the value of the dollar. You know, in, in Latin American countries, for instance, they do that a lot, they lock three zeros off of the peso and then issue some new paper money and everything goes on. Uh, we'll probably do something like that here where we, we say, okay, henceforth, the dollar is just a name for one ten thousandth of an ounce of gold. And what that means is the dollar has just lost a ton of value on the day they do that. So you, you don't want to have too much cash because that cash will be way less valuable, uh, which is to say the prices of things will go way up immediately. Uh, price, you know, milk might go from four dollars a gallon to nine dollars a gallon and, and everything else will go up accordingly. So, you know, it's it's. How much cash you should have on hand is really situational. You know, every every person's situation is different. Uh, you want to have enough to pay some bills if you need to. So, you know, a couple of months of expenses in cash on hand would be fine. But with the um, the caveat that that cash might, towards the end of this process, become a lot less valuable. Uh, but you don't want a ton of cash. You know, that's not something that you you put most of your savings in in this kind of world. You know, you, uh, you want your bank accounts to be as minimal as they can be to pay your bills. And then you want the rest of that money in real things that governments can't destroy on a uh, on a whim. Yeah, we've been talking with a lot of baby boomers who have homes that they've paid off and they're going to be selling or or ranch land that they're going to be selling off or businesses they may be selling or that kind of thing. Or they've had a 401k that's been building and building and building for decades. And now they realize all of those things are riding on the bubble of everything. They're riding on this faltering currency. They're riding on the potentially uh, collapsible uh, bubble of the stock or bond or real estate market. And they're wondering where do you go to not lose big time uh, should there be a, a reset in, in any of those uh, markets for people who want to keep searching for the right moves to make in this ongoing dollar collapse environment you as the founder of dollarcollapse.com help them know would you john how they can get plugged in well yeah i, I run dollarcollapse.com if you um stop by and put your email address in the join our mailing list box at the top of the page i'll send you whatever i write for free and then i i, I run a links list there that's just continuously updated with the headlines that uh, that relate to the stuff we just talked about well we're grateful always for your visits here with us on liberty and finance it's it's been an increasingly active time of concern and i would say awakening and this whole lockdowns and everything that we've been through for the last year and a half, I think has really opened up a lot of people's eyes to realize that 
uh, this is not the Garden of Eden and things aren't as they were told they were and the institutions that we've been trusting to give us valid information and to take care of, the, of our business as our trusted public servants have not been serving us but themselves as you mentioned. So it's a time of great awakening among the people and we're grateful for your help in that always here on Liberty and Finance. Thank you, John. Thanks, David. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. 